uh, before we get started, if people could uh, silence your phones, would it be? So you can silence your phones. Um, the restrooms are across the, if you go out the hall, they're out there. And we have a little Native Art Market in the building next door, and there's some more restrooms in there. The Wi-Fi code is UG2019, lowercase e. Uh, the cell reception in here is terrible, so you might want to log into the Wi-Fi. So, um, so it's Jay and uh, welcome to UG Butterfly Farm. We are just delighted to have you all here today. It is, it is such an honor. And um, we've had folks, we have folks here from, you know, Cree Nation in Canada, indigenous folks from Mexico, West Coast. Minnesota, our partners from Minnesota are here, so uh, it's just really a wonderful thing. Um, the land where we are today is uh, my great-grandmother's original allotment from 1899, when she was 16 years old. Her father was born along the trail during removal from the homelands, and our family has been here ever since. So uh, she always, I think, used this land as a sanctuary for family and friends. Um, she used it, uh, the land to produce food and gave that to people. Uh, in modern times, we're trying to extend that concept of sanctuary, whether it's for pollinators or species at risk um, or languages at risk, all of it. But to have you all here today is just very, very special. And um, just personally, thank each one of you for coming today and to start this conversation about you know what we do about the changing planet. So, um, but without uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce Mahana Nora Marshall from the College of Muskogee Nation, and she's going to welcome us with her, and she's going to personally welcome you to Muskogee Nation and talk about our history and our culture. So. We'll begin with the prayer, and then I have our. Uh, students from the College of the Muscogee Nation <coughs> coming to sing a hymn, and my uh, brothers from Uchi Nation will be coming and singing a hymn all So if ever you gave to us this day, we come before you. Mahavia, a gift that's the Hayya, no Aftida, in Yichida, Egana, Avastida, Idida, we did study, in Hawijida, Obonayidida, in Okodi. People of the Muscogee Nation, Yuchi Nation, and all tribal sovereign nations, caretakers of the land that you prepared for us. We open the talk and we gather today. Tafaluba, Fakagi, Ahujida, Heyo Hagi, Onapsi Hidi, Suleji. Butterflies, here to plant flowers, fruitful, prosperous, rich, to harvest and to gather from the ground. It is a great deal to us as Native people. Muskogee Idawa, Momen Ishtijari Omagia, Imitska, Momen Ida Bomen, Omifit, Imon Itskidaya, Obonaga, Iyas, Kosechimbodis. The Muscogee Nation and all tribal sovereign nations that you have blessed in that same manner, we humbly ask you to continue blessing us. Okmikida, Yichida, Momentakida, Janagi Imongadomia. Your kingdom, your power, and your glory always. Shehojimka, Ajajagida, Chima, to support us. In your three holy names are finished. Amen. You may be seated. Bowen Brass. We're going to sing one of their favorite songs. These young men have been leading this in our Muscogee hymn singing at the College of the Muscogee Nation. And then we're going to do the National Anthem of the Muscogee. Brothers will come forward with their That's okay. That's fine. Okay. <clears throat> 
Now everybody say Tabasana. Those are the dragonflies. They are also part of this. And then when they pollinate from the, the plants, it comes to the bees. Everybody say, um, was it T Taniki? Is, uh, the, the one that for Taniki is the bumblebee. Everybody say for Taniki. And then we have the other variations of the bees. But the most important one of the bees is Miko Hokti. Everybody say Miko Hokti. That's the queen bee. <laughs> Recently, so we have the queen bee. So all of you ladies, you're the queen bee of your house. <laughs> there might be a Miko in the house, but he's only Miko at his own house. Okay? <laughs> but the Hoktis, the Miko Hoktis, we're just queen bee everywhere we go. <laughs> so uh, just enjoy your day today and just take advantage of this opportunity to be a part of something so monumental and so important to the future generations. That's what our ancestors said when the ancient ones were coming on that forced removal on that trail. They would say, Huyuba, Awat, the ones coming behind us. And those were the ones that were not yet born when they were coming on that trail to Indian territory. And so we come today because we were the unborn generation that they were pulling and that kept coming forward because of us, because of the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and into how many generations now? We can trace back on one side of my family six generations. On the other side of the family, we trace back five generations. And then we have two more generations behind us that are born. So that is eight generations on one side of my family and seven on the other. And so we continue to carry that. And, and as you learn those things, preserve that. Write it down somewhere. Record yourself. We have so much technology now that if we can't write it down, we can at least record it with the camera. So, um, So next on our agenda, continuing through welcome to Muskogee Nation, we have uh, James Williams, who's the Director of Environmental Services for Muskogee Nation, and uh, also the sponsor of tonight's dinner in any way. We love him for that, but we love him for so much more. One of the things uh, at a previous conference when they were listing out some of these initiatives, uh, even though I try and keep up on it, I read our tribal newspaper, I wasn't even aware of everything that we're doing um, as a nation in the state of Oklahoma more than, uh, anyway, we won't, we'll just stop there. We're doing a lot and I'm very proud of it and I'm really excited to have him be able to share some of the initiatives that they're doing through the Scope Nation Environmental Services. So, James Williams. Well, welcome this morning. Certainly, you're here. I see some, uh, I don't want to say old faces, but friendly faces. <laughs> Uh, and some new faces we haven't met yet. So we're just glad that you're here at the Muskogee uh, Nation Reservation, and uh, we welcome you today. Um, I, I won't be able to stay all day. I wish I could, but I have another previous uh, meeting that I've got to go to uh, later on today. And so, but uh, man, enjoy your day. What a great day. I don't know if we could have got a better day than this, Ms. Jane. So uh, this is this is really good. Uh, I am Jane Williams. I'm the uh, director uh, for the Environmental uh, Office of Environmental uh, with the Nation. Uh, they've let me hang around about 30 years, and uh, this will be my 31st year I'm starting, so I've been there for a long time, so uh, I see a retirement on the horizon, so uh, but that's another story. But uh, we'll get started today. This is uh, just some of the things that our office has uh, uh, got going on. I uh, first have to give a shout out to my, uh, uh, some of my staff is here. Autumn Dearman helped put this presentation together. James Jackson, if you'll raise your hand, he's our lawyer guy back there. And uh, Christy Lawson, uh, is, yeah, she's right back there. She's our sustainability coordinator. So, uh, uh, I... 
this is a Dustin Pond uh, project uh, that we got going. Uh, James wrote a grant. He got a grant for 200 grand to uh, uh, refurbish this uh, uh, pond here. It blew out on this side, so we're going to refurbish all this uh, uh, at the Dustin Ranch down in Hughes County. And the adjacent pond bank will be utilized for uh, for planting new plants uh, for the uh, pollinators that we're going to do. So, Miss Jane, we're, yes. we're going to do that uh, down in uh, uh, the big community of the Dustin. Uh, we don't uh, really use this a whole lot anymore uh, because uh, we moved our ranch up into Oklahoma County uh, where we have our Cadillac, but uh, we're hoping to uh, have this uh, again. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this, this will work uh, for us right there. Another thing that we have going now is, uh, is some of our lagoons, are, uh, we're closing out our lagoons. Uh, this, is, this one is located in Okima. Uh, the and then we're going to develop, we're starting to develop these uh, old lagoon spots for uh, pollinator use. So that's something that we're going to start doing. Um, and we're looking forward to that. Another one we're doing is down in Misty Valley in McIntosh County. And that was closed in 2020, so we're just now getting this one ready to be developed for pollinator use also. So uh, uh, being as a, a TAC conference, we had to uh, say some of our initiatives on the pollinator. Uh, we're blessed. I don't know if we're really blessed or not, but uh, uh, we have some uh, super fun sites located in the Muskogee Nation Reservation. Uh, one is Henrietta Iron Bell down in Henrietta. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite the site. It's not a very big site, but it's a very costly site. This site's already cost uh, a little over $10 million to clean up, and it's a very small site. It's only about five or six acres, but it's, it was really radioactive, and it's really a mess. And so they're cleaning that up. Also, at, we have an active one in Bristow. Uh, it's the Wilcox Refinery. That's a little bigger site. It's about 80 acres. And uh, they're spending some money, but they're not spending the money like at that small Henrietta site. So you can tell uh, the Henrietta site was really contaminated. Uh, the Fansteel site, that's another story in Muskogee. Uh, that's another radioactive site. It's located in Cherokee uh, Reservation, but it's just right across the street from us, so that's a concern of ours. Also, the Broken Air Landfill, it was an old landfill. And somebody said, hey, we're, we're going to do something with this landfill. So they went to digging in it, and it was so radioactive, all they did was put the bucket back and just cover it up. It's too hot. That's it located in Broken Arrow. And then we have the Kiss, the Kiss Peanut Plant located there on Loggy. Uh, just not too far from the nation. Uh, there was another Superfund site there, the old Conoco plant, and we told them uh, 25 years ago that they ought to clean this site up, and they said, no, it's not as bad as the Conoco ones, and now they came back and said, you know what, we ought to clean that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> you know, and now it's costing the of money, because you know the price went up 25 years, so no time what it's going to cost them. But what all these have in common, what all these have in common is they're all located by a water source. Uh, all of them have water some way, shape, or form. In and our hill has a creek running right through there. Uh, Wilcox Refinery has it. The one in Henrietta is Dutch Creek, and it goes into Cole Creek, which goes into Lake Eufaula. Same thing with the Wilcox Refinery. It's located right by a creek. Uh, what's the creek's name, James? That one's it. It's right by, uh, but it goes into Deep Fork, and it also goes into Lake <laughs> Van Seal, it's right on the river. It's right on Arkansas River. It's right on the river. Uh, this last time it flooded, it got within a foot of discharging into the river. So that's just tragic. Broken Air has a creek right by there, and the Kiss, the Kiss Peanut Plant. There's a Logan Creek running right, right, right through it, and it goes to the deep fork and goes to the old, to the uh, lake. So those are some of the sites that we're that we keep an eye on, uh, just because it's in the reservation and we have a stake uh, in the uh, in the water and also in the land and the air. So those are some of the sites that are pretty high on our priority. The one in Kiss Camp is right across the street from us, so we cannot. Uh, about that. So we're here to uh, protect the citizens and the environment. And these are some really super high level, 
high profile sites that are located uh, within the Muscogee Nation. Uh, a lot of people don't have, have them, but uh, just our luck that we have them. This is another oil spill that we have here located in Hughes County. This was a tank battery up there. And as you can see toward the top, you can see where the oil was coming down and hit a pond and then it's traveling on down. And the operator said, uh, I think he said it was 55. Yeah, James, how many? Five, five yeah. to 10 barrels. Yeah, five to 10 barrels. He said it's only five to 10 barrels. <laughs> So when they tell us that, we usually times it times 10. <laughs> because that's the reality of it uh, when we see that. And so they, they call the uh, uh, Oklahoma Corporation Commission, and then we all get the notification, and we send some people down there, and we get up in the air. We send the drones up in the air, and it's, it's a bigger picture. Once I show you this next picture, you'll see that it's more than 55. <laughs> There it is, taking off. It's taking off. Where do you think that's going to? Headed to the water. Yeah. Headed to the water. It got real close to a drinking water reservoir. It was just that close. So this is some of the stuff that we deal with. When the EPA comes in, when the EPA comes in, bless their heart, good guys, they're just not from here. It's like when we're in our reservation, we know our backyard. You know, they don't know it. And so they say, well, I think we're going to have to agree with them. There's only 55 guys. Are you serious? Are you serious? What town yeah. is that close to? Holden. 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 Oh no. So, so the company comes out, they put out some booms, but do they really actually ever really get it? No. That's this next picture right here. They put the booms out, but still, this is the Canadian River. Look at there, it's still getting there. I'm not going to get it all. It's still getting there. That's just some of the stuff that we deal with. Uh, on a, on a regular, pretty regular basis. As a matter of fact, I got one yesterday. There's another leak in Kellyville. So, guess what? Pretty close to a water. You know. Uh, in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, well, I'll go as far as to say in all 50 states now, there's actually some advisories for fish consumption because somewhere in that state, you can't eat fish. It's in all 50 states now. Right? It's in all 50 states. So that's just something that we're concerned about too, your fish consumption. You know, I eat fish, fried, I prefer my fried. Here's another one. This is one in, uh, uh, in Old Fusty County. This is on some restricted property here. Uh, they have an oil lease here, but these old boys here, uh, this has been ongoing for, for two years or longer. I don't know how long it's been going on, but it's been going on forever. And uh, they just don't take care of the thing. And uh, it's all over the place. Actually, this caught fire uh, during a wildfire and burned. And, uh, it, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's just trouble. And guess what? Guess what's out there? A creek. So it's all leaking into this creek and headed to the Canadian River. That's just some of the things that we get caught out on. I don't really get to. I did go out on this one. Usually James and some of the other uh, uh, inspectors get to go out on this. Uh, it's a real impact to Indian country. Mm -hmm. It's a real impact uh, to Indian country. And so we uh, we want to we want to hold their feet to the fire if we can. Uh, this is the uh, BIA is over this uh, the BIA. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. It's been two years. I'm just saying to think that somebody would come in and say, well, "Hey, you need to clean that up." And hey, even sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot. This is the family of golf course. This was our golf course that we run. Somebody had a bright idea that they would take a big old excavator, dig a big hole, and they would dump all their pesticides in there. Oh. Uh, herbicides. Instead of paying a fee to have it properly disposed. So we got down there and it had killed some trees. It had uh, done some damage. They came to us and said, hey, can you guys help us out? And we said, well, we can, but uh, we're going to have to go to council and get an appropriation to clean that up. We got about $150,000 to clean that up because somebody didn't want to pay a $100 disposal fee at the end of the month. You know, so I'm just saying, it's always easier to clean that up. 
we had to test the walls down in there because this goes down to 20 foot. It was 20 foot uh, circumference and 20 foot deep. We got a frat truck in there and pump it all out, pump it down and pull all that out of there. And then uh, our guys cleaned that up. We have a solid waste group in our group. So they took all their equipment down there and cleaned it up for us. Uh, the guys worked pretty good inside of our office. And then once it got all cleaned up, we did the side walls in there inside the pit and made sure nothing was wet. We got all out. And those, those little fellows that dug this uh, just happened to put the dirt right there by it. So there's a big mound there. And we tested that to make sure that was good. And so then we were able to put it in there and clean that up to a pristine area. We told him, we said, hey, let's don't do that again. <laughs> you know, let's don't do that again. You know? And they said, okay. And now, now they're paying it. Now they're paying a disposal fee properly to get it done. You know, I, I have trouble saying now that I'm getting older, I can say what I want to. I was like, you guys are killing me. You know? <laughs> killing me. You know? so. These are some of my guys here that go into kayaks. We have some kayaks. We have a set of kayaks. These guys get out in the water. If they do have a spill or a leak, once the EPA got here, they just pulled up in a pickup and got out. Of course, you think they're going to be able to walk that creek on the dryers and stuff? There's no way. We can get in the water, we can get in drones, uh, we can see what's out there. Uh, so these guys get out there and they take a look at the stream bank uh, and, and look at the riparian area and see what damage is going to be there. So they can actually get out in it. If you see this other picture over here, uh, you can see the inflow on the lake and uh, see the different colors. You can't see that just looking out at the lake. You can't see that. But once you get up in the air and get out in there, you can see that. And if you can see this little part right here, that drone took a picture of a hawk, and there's a hawk there, and that's the, that's the shadow of it right there. So you don't ever know what it's going to take. You know, but that's, that's just so, it's just, to me, that's just so cool. Uh, if you get out there and you get to see stuff like that. Uh, James is uh, one of our, uh, our, our big water sampler, and he has to get out. And we were driving up this morning, he said, hey, this is the time to get out. You know, it's just, I said, it's like vacation weather. You know, I don't take my vacation until it gets 100. But this is vacation weather. And James gets to get out here in this stuff. So he's out there in the snow. Uh, I was just like, man, there's no other place that you're ever be than outside in nature. You know, so uh, I just had to throw the pictures in there. We have a recycling event coming up. This is from last year. This is what we collect for uh, uh, electronic e-waste. Uh, matter of fact, it's next next Friday. And uh, you can see the stuff that we collect, and there's a lot of it. Uh, we collect it from different schools, from the tribe. Uh, I don't care what kind of phone you got. Uh, usually when you get it, it's obsolete. Because there's a new one, bigger, better, always coming out. Computer, laptop, there's always something bigger, better. Uh, some of the stuff that we dispose of, uh, uh, we, we try to recycle it uh, in Tulsa with natural evolution, uh, you know, and so she does a real good job. But that's just how big a need there is for e-waste to keep it out of landfill. Because it's got all the lead and components in there that just don't know what to be in there. There's a Cynthia Tiger coming in, Blake. <laughs> My sister's friend. Yeah. And she always calls me Melvin's brother. <laughs> my sister's friend, so I had to call her. Good to see you, Miss Call me out. Also, we have an Earth Day uh, trash pickup. Uh, our flyers are back over there. Uh, we're having the trash pickup. This is last year's group. Uh, so we'll uh, load up and then we'll go out to the loop down there by the. Uh, uh, nation all the way out to the college and then this, this fine group here will pick up trash for a couple of hours and we usually get close to a thousand pounds of trash every year just on the loop miss marshall just on the loop that's it people the trash cans all over the place the trash cans all over the place they, they can't get that when they're going 50. <laughs> 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 Somebody wants to volunteer, you're more than welcome to come down and volunteer with us. We usually feed 
Uh, we're like a bunch of Methodists. Every time we meet, we eat. So uh, it's, it's good stuff. You know, so, but uh, that's, that's, what, that's what we do right there. And here's a flyer on it right here. It's, uh, hey, this one is this Friday. The community cleanup. Uh, next next Friday is the uh, uh, April of uh, April of 21st. And on the 19th, we have the kids coming in. Uh, we have the beard schools and some other uh, groups coming in. We're going to have a kid day that day. Uh, and so it's, all, it's always good to uh, start young. you got to get the kids involved when they're young. Usually if you get somebody that's my age that's pushing 65, it's hard for us to change our habits. Really? You know, I come in and sit in my same chair. I'm glad I'm sitting in my chair. And then uh, I went in my family room the other day. And somebody had changed the channel on ESPN. I said, somebody's in here. Because I don't ever change the channel. It's on ESPN all the time. But you start those kids out young, you get them to recycling, you get them to grow and stuff, you get them to looking at butterflies. You know, they, they, they see that. You know, they get used to that, you know. Uh, in this throwaway society, uh, there's so many things that if it doesn't go their way, or if something gets broke, throw it away and give them. You know, that's just what it is now. Uh, back, way back when, when our uh, grandparents, uh, they were pretty minimalist uh, already, and they made do with what they had and made what they had to work. So, that's just what they did. Uh, this is my contact information. Those are some butterflies. Uh, James is out. If you really watch, if you really watch for butterflies, they're out there. You can see them. And there's all sorts of species of butterflies, and look at this good. He just pulled up there and took that picture of him out there. Uh, you got any questions uh, for me? Uh, we're, I didn't want to get too, uh, uh, too over the top today because I know it's the TAP conference. And, uh, but we're just wanting to show you some of the stuff that we've got out there, we've got going, some of our programs that we do. We have several more. These are the ones that are outside and that we love the most. Uh, our solid waste uh, does uh, community cleanups for churches and ceremonial grounds. Hang on just one second, guys. And, uh, and so that's a big push on ours right now because guess what? A lot of the ceremonial grounds in the churches are located by uh, water. You know, so we're trying to keep everything out of the can out of the water. I forgot to tell you, on the other uh, slide here, on the Big Friday one, uh, we, we take appliances, white goods, tires, Anything like that, we'll take them. Because there's not a place to take them anymore, but we'll take them. We take batteries. Only no batteries, we don't take lithium. But we take a lot of things. Uh, we don't take hazardous waste on this one, but we do have the hazardous waste collection later in May. Uh, it's just going to be too much for us. But uh, uh, we're, we're there at the Recycle Center, just north of the complex there. And it's open for, we'll take anybody's uh, recyclables. And, uh, and that's a big that's a, that's a big day for us. But but uh, I'll take some questions down. Are you guys had some? Okay. Yes. Because you probably just answered when you said anybody's. Uh, like I'm from Tulsa County, so if I go down to Omohi County, the ask the get rid of my e waste and all that. Sure, we'll take, take it. Okay. We'll take it. I, I got my brother-in-law that uh, he's real. Uh, He's, he don't trust the government for nothing. <laughs> and he says, uh, I got some shreds I need to bring to you. I said, okay, we'll shred it for you. You know, it comes all the way from Owasa just to bring it down there. <laughs> you know, but he brings it down there, and it comes in like a little body box. <laughs> but I'll take it. Okay. You know, I'll take it. Yes, sir. I'm from Muskogee. Uh, Fansteel is right five miles from the house maybe. Yeah. That project has been there for twenty years. Yeah. The paint's still closed. Yeah. Why can't they move some of that waste, especially the wastewater? Yeah. The ponds or the They're having a, a hard time getting it moved anywhere. There's only one place in the country that takes it. And it's out in the Yucca Mountains and uh, it's almost full. And so they're having a hard time getting rid of this radioactive stuff. Oh and theirs is with some rods Theirs was, uh, uh, what was in Broken Air? Was it Thorium at uh, Broken Air, James? And, Thorium and Broken Air. And then what was it, Fan Steel? Uh, I'll think of it. Later. Basically, your, the flak off the uranium. Yeah, the rods. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, so that was, that was a little more severe. Yeah. And so, but, uh, yeah, they're having a hard time moving it. They're having a hard time moving it. You can see it's on, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there used to be a little 
whitewash right off of that wood. Right. It went down the side of that clear. Yep, it did. It did. You know, um, so they have these big fish tournaments there. I don't know if you've ever been to the Yeah, these yeah, big, big fish tournaments. Holy cow. Yeah. You might know, get some fish out there that look like they're green. They went floating. Yeah, I'm just like, I think that's what you're going on. Uh, and, and fan steel went broke, and so now the government's had to pick up on that, and so they're trying to make some initiative. Actually, we're missing a meeting right now. We have a fan steel meeting today in Oregon, and uh, that's what they're talking about. So uh, they invited us, but we have a lady on, on the on so there's nothing on the horizon. Yeah, they're trying to. They're trying to get that, but uh, let's hope it's some movement. Uh, we waited, we waited uh, from the 60s, uh, that place in Henrietta, and it's just finally getting it going. And the one at Wilcox, it's, it's been inactive since the 40s. So, I mean, uh, government wheels turn slow. You know, very slow. But, but very slow. But hopefully they'll get something done. I think that's a good question. Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Why? Why that? Why that? Why that? Why that? He says why that because he knows so that's what I got. That's why I got a problem with that. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, Nate, I'll tell you the story that he did for my birthday the first time. First time I there. The sign in Oklahoma is that the peanut sign? Is yes. that where the big smoke stack is? Yes. Yes. Like that's it. Okay. That's it. I just wondered. Yeah. We, we were out there. A long time ago. Yeah, we were out there years ago, and uh, the stuff seeps up in the summertime. It's just like walking on a sponge. But then in the wintertime, it gets hard to see it. Is it actual? It's oil. It's oil. It's just oil. So, this is, I, I drove by there yesterday just so I could see it. And one scoop uh, of a front end loader, it was nothing but black. It's just hydrocarbon, so it's just oil. Well, and guess what? It's right by a creek. Any more questions on this side? Okay. Go, go ahead, John. Are you also doing the composting at the recycle center? Uh, we, we're not right now, but we're ready to go again. Uh, we're ready to start it again. So we did there for a while, for some years, but uh, we're ready to do that again. I think we'll have uh, some demonstration. You'll come over there and do it for us next week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Are you guys hiring? Do you guys do like We do. We do. Actually, we have, uh, uh, we should have about a group of 20. I think we only have 18 right now. We're looking for an air monitoring person to work with Chris. And then we have one of the instructor to hire too. So, but yeah, we're on the web. We've got to just get on the web. We're on the road. We're looking for a few good men. We're ladies. Anybody else? Ms. Jane? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Ms. Jane, thank you for having us. Thank you for your staff and all that you guys do here. We support you 100%. So. Well, thank you for all you all do for the nation and to keep the water safe for everybody that lives within the boundaries of the Mississippi. That's right. So you're working for all of us, not just uh, our Muscovy people. So. That's right. We're working for the whole entire crew. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank so, you so much. Okay. All right. And so next, and I don't know about how to change over this projector thing, but you can come up here, Patrick. Switch over there. I didn't want to get your initial thing. I'm just going to introduce you for a moment. Okay, all right. There you go. Then when you get ready, just press that down about three seconds. Okay, so our, our next speaker um, giving, <laughs> actually our, our keynote presentation um, is Patrick Friedman. Uh, he was the formerly the Natural Resources Director, or uh, Instructor, whatever, Program Manager at College of Muskogee Nation, and now is doing a lot of other really exciting stuff with climate and the Lichen Network. I'll let him talk more about that. Um, we were kind enough, um, we, Cindy Wood from the college was kind enough to refer us to him and he was instrumental in making this whole thing happen. Um, he, if, if you, you were, you were, and there was at one point nobody was getting back to me and he's like, 
just text them all. Jane, I'm just going to give you the personal phone number. She just started calling, and he's like flipping these out. Anyway, it was wonderful. So anyway, thank you, because you not only were a logistical guide, but you were a spiritual guide for this as well. So anyway, Mido, and he's also a part of YouTube team. So anyway. All right, so there we go. So much media is given to everyone, so many bad news, so much stimulation, sensation. But what you're holding on to right now, that's what's going to get you through everything. So just remember that. <clears throat> so today I want to talk a bit about this idea of not just climate change and not just what, you know, what can we do maybe policy-wise or what can we do um, as people, but really as individuals. And I think the best way to think about this is uh, a little big to start off with yourself and maybe find another and then another and another. So a bit of an overview for what I'm going to talk about a bit today. Um, just kind of an introduction to like, I'm not going to do like climate 101, but just like an idea of like how I understand climate change, how I understand climate sciences. Uh, and then looking back at some historical climate models for um, Tulsa County and kind of Oklahoma in general. And they're really discussing this idea, there's three concepts I want everyone to understand of risk, of uh, vulnerability, and of impact, right? And then using this language to really think about the rest of this conference, right? How can we understand risk? How can we understand impact? And then really understand what is vulnerability in relation to ourselves and our peoples. And then kind of think we'll start looking at some climate models moving forward, thinking, well, what can we really expect based on our best science in Tulsa County, um, you know, in this kind of, kind of region in general? And then from all that, we'll think about, okay, what matters? Our relationships, uh, our sovereignty, as not just indigenous peoples, but as individuals, as humans being, and our responsibility. You know, now that you have knowledge, what do you do about it? You know, now that you have agency, ability, access, what do you do? And I'll give you some techniques that, that I found have been really helpful in terms of like understanding what resiliency is and how you can center that and center that with you know not just native people, but people, right? With a capital P. And then if we have any time, I know we're a little bit behind schedule, but if we have time, we'll we can have a little conversation, talk about some of this. So to start. When I was a kid, I grew up around the uh, Keystone area out towards Mansford. Um, we owned a lot of the lands. And I loved storms. And my whole family, we always had a strong connection to them. I remember I used to be able to look up the sky and be able to read it. I knew exactly what it was going to do. You know, I could feel the air, I could feel the temperature. You know, my whole family was like that. I moved away from Oklahoma for about, about 20 years or so. And when I got back, I couldn't read the sky anymore. You know, things that I would see, see those little mammoths clouds. We used to see those things, little bubbles, and they get inside pretty quick. Not anymore. Now you see something called undulatus clouds. They almost look like the under, if you're under, under the water looking at like the surface, those are new. Those used to be incredibly rare. Now you see them about once a month. So, my sense is that things are changing. And when I was a kid too, and I'm sure all of you can relate to this, but when storms would hit, you know, favorite show is interrupted by Travis Meyer. And he's telling you all about, you know, you know, some, you know, something down in Fox County, and I'm up in Creek County, and doesn't matter. But 
But I always wondered, like, where do those colors come from? Right? How do, how do they know that? Right? And then I'd see the storm chasers running around, you'd see the big radar balls, you know, see everything by the airport. And it, it kind of blew my mind. How can we use radio to like look at the clouds? And so when we think about weather, we're really thinking about two things then, right? So the first piece is that you're collecting data, just information. You have every airport, you know, most major uh, uh, like federal or municipal buildings, they all have weather monitoring stations near next to them, right? And so we can get an idea of the temperature, of the humidity, of pressure, of the wind. Um, but then you also have to understand atmospheric processes, right? So the same reason that water freezes at 32 degrees, right? The same reason that uh, water boils at, you know, 100 degrees Celsius where, you know, and then you have this, this range, you know, th those physics apply all over our planet, all over our universe, right? So if you understand the atmospheric chemistry, and you can look at the data and look at your observations, you can get a pretty good idea of what's going on. And so this idea of collecting data uh, is really important, I think, in terms of like when we start to think about modeling um, what's going to happen with our atmosphere, right? And we have satellites now, we've got you know almost a century worth of uh, meteorological, like you know, high precision meteorological data. And so we've got a pretty solid idea of how the atmosphere works. And just as uh, forecasting the weather is like really challenging, you get a, a better idea of like what's probable, right? You never, never know exactly what time the storm's gonna hit, you never know exactly what it's gonna do, but you get a pretty solid idea. And now you can usually tell days out, you know, what's going to happen. But when we think about climate then, so weather is a very specific event. It's raining, you know, it's 70 degrees out right now, you know, it's storming. And it could happen over a few hours. And we've had storms that have lasted days, storm cells that cruise through. Uh, but usually short term, when we're thinking of climate, what you're actually thinking about is the average. Right? The average over time temperature. You know, the average weather conditions, the average humidity over time. And usually climate is something that's tens of years long, right, when you're looking at it. Usually frames of about 30 years up to 100 years. And so you're looking at long-term atmospheric changes. You're looking at trends. So when we look back, uh, the hottest time on record in Oklahoma was uh, 1936. You know, this is a picture of Tulsa over around there. You can see definitely a lot of, you know, it's over off our side. Not much has changed. I think they're building the bridge back. But the, uh, about that same time, in kind of the western part of Oklahoma was the, the, basically the end of the Dust Bowl, right? And so there's a lot of correlation with vegetation and the climate, right? And so all this hot, dry air from the west is making its way, it doesn't have any, you know, um, trees to slow it down, or doesn't have moisture in the vegetation to kind of cool it down, right? So I don't know if anyone's been up to the gathering place, right? You know, there's like vegetation things growing everywhere. It's usually about 10 degrees cooler there if you go just, you know, south about a block. Same deal as here, you have lots of things growing, the wind's a little calmer, it feels a little nicer. Um, but the same thing was going on. So, so when we think about trends of like things like say global warming, and they say, well, the hottest day is in you know, the 1930s. Well, there's reasons for that, right? It's a complex system. And so the same deal, we look at the impact of the Dust Bowl, right? You know, it kind of happened, again, in kind of Panhandle area over in North Texas, Western Oklahoma, but the, the atmosphere moves to the east, right? So what happens there has an impact on that effect there. Actually, there's still remnants of um, um, some of the sediments that you can still track today. You can usually, you know, dig deep enough, you'll find the layer. So another thing to keep in mind about the state of Oklahoma is you start making your way west and you climb up about 4,000 feet, right? And so um, that affects the climate, right? So this kind of like if I were to climb higher and higher and higher, it gets a little bit drier, right? Because our atmosphere is, you know, not that thick, right? You know, so if I make a couple thousand feet, it's going to have a little bit of difference. But then as you get down to around Rio, you know, the Soviet Beach country, and we're about you know, 200, 300 feet in terms of elevation. And so when we think about our annual temperatures then, you know, again, kind of going back, you don't know, in terms of equal region, it's relatively the same. That uh, that latitude makes a difference, right? You know, so if I go down to you know, Ada, it's probably going to be a lot hotter than Tulsa. You know, I used to ride a uh, college station on my motorcycle, 
And I remember I always passed this one hill, and every time the weather was always a little bit warmer, about 10 degrees warmer, you know, or it was a little bit more humid in that spot, right? Because we have these landscape variations that affect our local climate. So I think one of the challenges that we see in, in media um, with looking at big, big data or graphs like these is they might be global. You know, you hear a lot of them in the news, we need to keep like to 1.5 degrees Celsius. What does that mean? Not really much, right? You know, and that's for the entire planet. Because again, you have these averages and you have the sums of your averages. And so the idea is how can we pull this apart? How can we tease it apart? So uh, let's take over to Oklahoma as a climatological survey. I think it's ok.climate.gov. Tons of information. You know, stuff that usually happens right now, really useful for farmers, really useful for people that are doing manufacturing, basically anything where you know weather trends might impact you. But you can kind of see this goes back to about the 1900s to 2012 was their last recorded date. And you can see this, you know, this fluctuation. You know, some years is a little bit colder, average temperature, excuse me, about 59, and some years is a little warmer. And you kind of see this oscillation. And that's natural. Right? You know, our sun, about every 10, 20 years, puts out a little bit more heat, and then it kind of goes kind of cools down a little bit, a little more heat. Uh, we have, uh, because of the oceans that kind of have these large oscillations over time, you know, we'll get like, you might have heard like La Nina or El Nino years. We're about to enter an El Nino year, so it should be interesting. Although we had an extended La Nina, which is a cooler part of the Pacific, so that's why we have, you may have heard of the atmospheric rivers, right? Because the temperature of the surface is a little bit warmer. So it evaporates, more moisture in the air, more you know, moisture in the atmosphere, it has to go somewhere. Like that. So kind of looking back at our past, and we can kind of see, um, you know, this is a lumpy county, so a little, a little cooler, you know, on average, right? But this is, you know, five, so the northeastern, um, or excuse me, this is Tulsa County, so a little bit cooler than Oklahoma statewide, right? So this gives us a little bit more scope, a little bit more resolution, right? So okay, this is closer, this maybe fits our observations a little bit more. And if we look at uh, Olympia County, even just a little bit cooler, and you know, one big reason why there's a lot more lakes and rivers in the county. Same deal when we look at things like precipitation, so annually, Go further east, it gets a little more green. You know, green country of Oklahoma, then we were to be out in the red dirt country. And so a lot of this follows that same kind of gradient of our elevation, right? It follows some of those kind of heat trends. But you'll notice that even though it's hotter in the south than it is in the north, it's actually a little bit wetter in the south, right? Because heat and precipitation aren't always uh, dependent on each other. Same so deal, we can look at years of rain and drought. You know, we do have seasonal droughts in this part. We have you know, very heavy rain seasons. As you can see, over time, we've had kind of like as a state, we've had generally wet periods. You know, Tulsa County tracks with that a little bit rainier, right? You know, on average, we definitely have more water here than in other places. And same thing with Oklahoma County, about a little bit, a little bit less. But uh, the, the seasons and the patterns uh, track about the same. So again, this is this is our past. You know, this is you know, model from actual temperature data, um, you know, and then very uh, like this line of fit. You know, using just kind of really basic statistics to see what's going to be the closest of all these all these ranges. But you can see like it, the best analogy I have for an average is like imagine like a big pit of gravel. Well, I could tell you the average size of that of a rock in that pit. But if I dig through all of those pieces of gravel, I probably won't find a rock that exact same size. Right? But it's going to be close, going to be very close to that piece. So now when we start thinking in probabilities, we start thinking in uh, non-absolutes, we have to kind of change our thinking a bit to be a bit more multi-universal. We have to think of different possibilities that things could be. So the idea of risk uh, for uh, federal emergency managers it's basically an equation, right? I'm not going to do too much math up here. But so if we think about uh, the probability of an event occurring, right? And the consequences if that happened. So best thing is to think of like a, uh, yeah, so let's say uh, um, you know, you're, you're, you're low on gas, right? 
and I'm driving in a while for a gas station. What happens if I run out of gas? Well, I might have to call it, you know, tow truck. It's going to cost like you know, $200 and all this stuff. So you, you're, you're making a risk by thinking how probable is it that I'm going to run out of gas, right? So you can, you can have this same equation for just about anything. But the thing is about risk, especially in federal agencies or others, is entirely monetary, right? Very rarely is risk calculated for uh, indigenous ceremonial impacts, right? It's very rarely accounted for for how healthy are the people? Are they eating well? Are, like what quality of life? So that's something to keep in mind. Impact, on the other hand, is something that you can measure. So if uh, um, let's say we have a flood and you can measure, well, what was the actual impact of that flood? Because it's not always just the water and where it was. Maybe someone lost a job. Maybe that person losing their job wasn't able to take care of a relative. Maybe that relative got sick, right? So impact is systemic. You know, something can happen in one place, but it can have a very large sprawl, right? So you think about risk, you think about impact, and then you think about this idea of vulnerability. Vulnerability is a word, there's actually a lot of pushback on this, and, and a lot of folks that I talk with right now, they really don't like using it, because usually when we talk about vulnerable populations, it's persons of color, it's native peoples, it's uh, the elderly, it's the infirm. And it's almost uh, stigmatizing at times, right? But I like to think of the Latin root of vulnerability, which means to wound. And so if you are wounded, how likely are you to heal from that wound? And so it's really the susceptibility of people. And so vulnerability as a concept centers humans. So would you include trauma in there? Absolutely. And arguably, you could, you could actually include trauma and risk if you think about healthcare costs. And these categories aren't, aren't necessarily, there's a lot of overlap, and there's a lot of like interchange at times. So again, yeah, what are climate risks that we're going to kind of do here that are going to impact us? So increased temperature, right? You know, easiest thing to think of like, uh, how much you spend on air conditioning, right? How much is your electricity bill? It's going to go up, because you need more air conditioning. Uh, severe flooding, right? A lot of evidence of that happening pretty historically, so ongoing. I'm sure you all are very aware of that. Geospatial, or geospatial, I think, did a flood uh, assessment of the uh, uh, meat plant. And then, of course, severe drought. Now, Agricultural operations are our ways to make it more, more resilient, but with drought, you have kind of exacerbates your flooding at times. The soil gets a little too hard. Uh, only certain insects that kind of can thrive in that, like ants, would be more likely to reproduce than pollinators. So impacts that we're looking at, um, biggest one, at least from, from my perspective, is the ecological destabilization. You know, we have a pretty resilient ecosystem here in, in this kind of prairie system. You know, it, can, you know, it gets a little bit hotter, you know, it's not going to be too much an impact, it's not going to necessarily cause a lot of wide extinction, but it will limit your biodiversity. Less insects, um, less birds, less, less plant species that rely on those insects. Uh, a lot of agricultural and economic impacts, right? If you look at uh, Lone Tulsa and Omogi County, like uh, we have a you know, high poverty rate, and that's only going to really increase. Um, but a lot of like healthy um, economic areas usually have some kind of agricultural base. So the more you lose an agricultural base, the more it's going to affect your bottom line because of food. Right? Everyone has to eat every day. So if you're able to get localized food that's you know not expensive, doesn't have high transportation costs, you know you save a little bit more at the, at the bank. Uh, severe drought again going to be you know, pretty impactful. You know, uh, same thing. Access to water. Right, you know, you're talking about already the challenges you have of keeping the water clean, that limits it, but temperatures rise, evaporation a little bit more from your lakes and reservoirs, uh, and it, the soil, if it gets too dry, it's really hard to recharge, so you lose all your groundwater potential. Wildfire, right? Um, you know, a lot of that's just because of, you know, drought, pulling water out of you know, prairies or woods, and it'll spark up a little bit easier. Erosion. And something that I don't think is really quite, we haven't seen the brunt of it, the population distribution. So when you think about places like uh, Saharan Africa, uh, the Indian subcontinent, um, you know, even places in, say, like, uh, kind of Central Europe, you know, people are dying right now, right? You know, like, I think last year in Sudan, they had, like, like about, I want to say, it was something crazy, I want to say, like, 500 million deaths. Yeah, may not have been that much, but it was in the millions, either five or 500, but really significant. 
And so as people are unable to live in very hot places now, they migrate, right? Uh, they migrate to the poles. And so this could be an area. Um, right now, property values are a little bit lower, although that's kind of like you know, rapidly increasing. So you're going to see a lot more people here that aren't from here. Right? In terms of vulnerability, number one, in my opinion, is public health, right? Um, who's ever like just been kind of broke and just like stressed out about it and they forgot to eat and they forget, like all that stuff like that. So the stress, and that's why I really wanted you all to kind of be careful with this. The stress is the real killer in this, right? Uh, traditional plants and foods, highly vulnerable, right? Because it's, they don't necessarily, it's not necessarily just because of the heat or the flooding, but because they rely on a complex ecosystem to be able to sustain them. Uh, resource availability. You know, food's going to be one of the largest ones. Water's going to be one of the largest ones. But if you have limited resources, prices go up. It causes conflict. Uh, property damage because of these things. You know, it sounds like it's really expensive to clean up what's, you know, like a 20 foot hole, right? So imagine if, you know, a house burns down once every week, right? How expensive it's going to be to clean up over time. You know, environmental contamination. We have a lot of, uh, you know, we have a lot of industry in this part of the world. Uh, we're actually going to be seeing a rapid reindustrialization of the North American continent due to some of the major conflicts. You know, right now you're already seeing a lot of manufacturing moving from China to India. A lot of the Indian production is about 50%, which is a terrible yield. So that's where you're starting to see more and more chip applications. Like even if you look at uh, what's Sperry, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and all the plants popped up there really quickly. Oklahoma's ripe for that, uh, that reindustrial application. And industrial applications are kind of notorious for making messes. Uh, and of course, this place it, right? It can be really hard when you're living, you know, don't have a lot of income, don't really need much, but the things get pricier and pricier and pricier. It's tougher to live where you are and may force you to relocate to somewhere else. I think one picture that kind of sums all of this up, right? <laughs> Yeah. This is uh, 2018. Um, this happened, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like the you know, river's flooding. But it flooded so quickly and so drastically, right? So, what can we think about? What can we prepare for? So, again, kind of when we think about modeling, <coughs> we're thinking about sums of averages. About distribution, how likely, right? You know, top of the curve means pretty close. You know, that one piece of gravel, it's almost there. You know, get to the tails, maybe less likely. But when you see those averages start to advance, again, it's not exact. You know, and then over time, you collect data, your models get better. You know, maybe something big changes, but you got a pretty good idea where we're going. So let's look at close County. So average temperature. So this comes from two models that the, the uh, IPCC uses, the RCP, which is Representative Concentrated Pathways, model uh, 2.8, which basically says we do everything right. We go green, we, you know, we stop mowing our lawns, everything right. We're starting today. And then the red is uh, RCP 8.5. It means we don't do the damn thing. In fact, we double down. You know, we get kind of, kind of worse at it. So you can see a trend moves up over time, right? These are only like one degree marks, right? So if we look at, you know, say, baseline of about 71, and then maybe about, you know, 10, 15 degrees. Well, what does that mean? Well, so we are our observed average from the range of 2015 to 2013 was 72 degrees. You know, that's our average temperature. So we use that number. So the high emissions, um, you know, about from here to about 2040, Go up about 74.5 degrees, a two degree difference. Yeah, not much. You know, but interesting enough, we also do the right thing about the same temperature. Why? It's because we're paying for decades of um, uh, greenhouse gases, of other things into our atmosphere. Right? And we go to about 2035, about 2065, and well, high emissions, about 76 degrees on average. Again, not too much, you know, but you notice that it's a little bit less in the uh, uh, low emissions scenario, about 75. I did want to point out, you can see how variable these models are, right? So it could be 75.8, that's that top of the curve, you know, the, the 
uh, far tail end about 68 degrees, far high end about 83 degrees. But most likely going to be in that kind of 70s range. So if we look at uh, 2060 to about 2090, now we're up to about 79 degrees. Again, doesn't seem like that much. And if we uh, uh, kind of notice that low emissions, this one also assumes that, see how it's actually gone down a little bit? So if we do it right, like we have a resilient planet we live on. We can actually see a little bit of stabilization. You know, planting and what they call afforestation, so planting lot trees really helps with that. So this is what I think is a better way of looking at the same data. So let's think about this. Like how many days, like the highest low, like a day that, you know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning and it doesn't get below 80 degrees. Now this is something to think about, right? Because the human body at about 87 degrees, if we don't get out of the heat, we, we die, right? And not just humans, but animals, birds, things like that. So it's these extreme heats that we gotta, gotta worry about. And so historically, we can see a handful of days, not many, really. And actually, most years, it was less than one on average of, of days where the, the low was above 80 degrees. And again, you can see what's interesting is you see how like, all of a sudden that variation is really wide, right? Compared to our data, we know pretty solidly you know, what the temperature ranges were. Let's think about this climate model. It actually incorporates prior data to see how accurately that fit does for what they call backcasting to get an idea of how probable the, the forecast would be. So looking back, observed days per year, the minimum temperature above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. You know, 1954, again, dust bowl, about seven, seven days. 1956, three days. 1980 was a hot one. The you know, sun was really cooking that year, 10, 10 days. 2001, there was one. 2006, there were six. 2003, then 2011, there were 11. Um, again, my, my sample goes only through 2012 for historic data, but I got a feeling if we looked at the past 10 years, we'd see quite a bit more numbers. Like this year, I'm really interested to see how hot it was. Last year, same deal again. Um, so we run this. And I'm going to do in 10 year increments and go through these kind of quick. But, you know, 13 days from 2020 to 2029, higher than history. 13 days above that minimum temperature of 80 at night. Does so that mean? We see more wildfire. Actually, quite a bit. We're already starting to see it. We all remember, so I happened at the hospital in Edmond a couple weekends ago. It went up really quick, right? It was hot, it was dry, it was windy. That's one thing that's not going to change here, right? It's going to be windy in Oklahoma for quite some time. <laughs> Ten years after that, well, what happens? About 19 days, the high end about 18. So regardless if we do everything right or we do nothing at all, we're looking at hotter, drier days. What happens when you get too hot for too extended? Your plants scorch, right? And especially your prairie plants, right? Flowering plants, because it takes them a lot, it takes a lot of moisture. Yeah, 2040, 2049, we're looking at 27 days at our high end, nearly a month, you know, versus 16 days. What does that mean? We spend a lot more time inside, right? We spend a lot more time in the air conditioning. If you don't have air conditioning, you need to find it or else you are at risk of uh, very severe health problems. You know, what happens 2050, 2029, we're looking at about 30 days. Again, not much more about, you know, slight temperature increases. But those temperature extremes start to go up. You see a lot more drought. You see a lot more uh, desiccation of reservoir bodies, right? So they don't recharge as quickly. You see a lot more erosion because as these things dry, the dust rolls off. 2060, livestock you can't do anymore. It's just too hot. You're looking at about a month and a half of days above 80 degrees. Uh, unless you're doing an uh, animal feeding operation that is covered, which we'll probably see, uh, some of you that work in, in that industry, you'll probably see more and more of that occurring now. Uh, but then you see little emissions. You know, now we're starting to see that, that branching out a little bit. But again, see these variables. So it could be higher. It gives about 2070. Uh, roads buckle on the regular. We've got three months or two months of where it doesn't get below. 80 degrees during the day, during the night. But low emissions model, we stabilize a little bit. So even saying, 
even if we do everything right, we still need to prepare for a much hotter uh, um, possibility of weather, of, of uh, daily temperatures. We get to 2080, and again, then you start seeing infrastructural problems, right? The water's already scarce at this point, now it gets really hard to, like let's say if a house burns down, well they may not be able to spare the water uh, to put it out. And then 2090, 2099, you're not doing anything, Looking at about two and a half months, maybe upwards of three months of, of days per year above 80 degrees. You know, a lot of rural areas will hold up just because they just can't sustain the people that live with them. You'll start seeing a rapid urbanization. More and more people not only moving to cities, but moving in with other relatives, right? So don't look that scary, right? People live in like, you know, Qatar and Saudi Arabia and you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, places that are much hotter than this always, right? You know, there's still ecosystems there, there's still life there, but the lifestyle changes significantly, right? But this is a challenge, right? Is, you know, might go back to the plants, but if you think about days below freezing, right? And this one is huge when it comes to like what crops you're going to select. Roots need cold, like seeds need freezing to be able to open up. So we look historically, you know, 1978, coldest, uh, coldest day on record in the county, with 107 days below freezing. Right, you can see that this trend kind of, kind of moves around. If you look at this one, we've got, you know, again, we've got a little bit of an oscillation, but even though that line of fit, which is about 80 days below freezing, or minimum temperature gets below freezing, um, the trend is kind of like starting to see less and less days. So 2020, when we're looking about 70 days and below freezing, which is much lower, like last year, winter kind of happened, sort of, right? Snow is what, maybe. Um, we'll go ahead, another 10 years, 2030, and less freezing days. Well, if you're an agricultural producer, you probably notice the, the less hard freezes you have, the less freezing, the more insects you have, right? Uh, squash bugs were really bad last year. They were really bad this year. They ate them, spider mites, ants. Like basically all the um, pests and insects are going to be predominant because they actually thrive in the heat, but they are water uh, dependent, right? So they, they can thrive in the heat, but not in the drought. You know, we start seeing that drop a little bit. You know, 32 or 2040s. All of a sudden, at this point, it might not be viable to keep trees. Uh, well, certain trees, pine trees for sure. You know, because they need that cold. You know, they need that life cycle in order to, to fully express. We actually notice most pine trees now they're doing uh, this number with their leaves. They start pointing up. They shouldn't do that. They should go out like this because they're they're thinking like, hey, it's hot. It's time to reproduce. You know, they make cones like year round now. They shouldn't do that. But if you also notice, you get a branch tug snaps right off, right? Because they're really not ready for this type of environment. Moving forward, same deal. Um, significant impacts to plant life. Um, we start seeing a transition to more of an arid environment. Right? You probably start seeing more species that you might see like um, kind of in, you know, towards Altus, Oklahoma, or New Mexico, right? And actually like the same thing, if you're thinking about how to landscape yard, you look at what New Mexico's doing, that's probably going to be the way to do it moving forward. We just want to save some money. You know, same deal. You get uh, 2060s and your plants just, they might root, they might grow, but they don't have that cold they need to really, in the soil temperature, to really spread out, take root, build that foundation. So things like um, cereal grains, corn, soybeans, probably not. You know, wheat. Maybe, but it's not going to be healthy, and it's also going to be water dependent, so that can be a challenge. And then we get about 2070, yeah, about 40 days that time. You know, so we went from about two and a half months to about a, about a month and a half. Again, it starts getting very arid. Right. 2080, again, you start getting you know, things like cedars. You know, we'll, all, we'll be really struggling, you know, out in that combination of heat and that lack of, a, of a, an overwinter for them to kind of reestablish themselves and to fight off inside pressure. About 2090, 2091, and we'll see mosquitoes in the snow, 
right? If you get a snow, maybe once or twice. So that's the thing about, you know, there are certain species in this world that welcome this new world that we're coming into. You know, I once had a professor that said, the next world belongs to the grass, the ants, and the mosquitoes, right? So keep that in mind. So, oh, good news. Um, we're probably going to have about the same amount of precipitation, slightly, slightly less. The bad news is, as you see, this variability increasing because the warmer air uh, means that the air holds more humidity. You know, the more humidity you have, the more uh, likely you are to have uh, storms and whatever. In, in atmospheric science, they call it a K point. So basically, you have, you know, if you look at the cloud and it builds up, and it kind of, kind of um, um, ammo heads out, then all of a sudden, boom, it'll start raining, right? Well, that's the K point when it starts raining, because there's a certain cool that happens in there. So what we'll actually see is we'll see less rain. You know, we might see more clouds with less rain, but when it does rain, it's going to rain much more significantly. Now, this is kind of like a, a frontier of kind of like clouds and, and storming events in, in climate science. Uh, one of my team is actually working on a model right now that's even more hyper-local, but incorporates this. We couldn't get it running for today, um, but, you know, stay tuned in the future. So just keeping that in mind, it's going to have about the same amount of water and the rainy season shrinks, but the amount of water increases, but equiv equivalently about the same amount. So things like uh, uh, prairie, what does it do? It catches rain quicker, right? Things like um, uh, wetland restoration, right? Things like you're talking about transforming lagoons. So building, you know, wetlands can help with that and help prepare for that. <laughs> and the same deal, looking at um, the amount of rain per year. Again, relatively the same, slightly less in, in, in some areas, but again, the variability just goes off the rails. So weather gets increasingly more difficult to predict. Uh, rain events get harder. Um, and the likelihood of a rainy gets lesser. All right, well, have a great day, folks. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right, I want to run through the, through the, the hard news with you first. Uh, how are you doing? All right. anyone, is anyone scared? No. 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 Is anyone. Uh, it's okay to feel your emotions right now. I just want to put that out there. That this, you know, that again, remember this is something that it can seem frightening and highly probable for where we're going from here. But there's a lot that we can do about it. And so a lot of my, I like to call it my work, but it's like my life. I've kind of found that there's a technique um, that comes from, I guess, it comes from who I am. Like I, I thought I was to learn this from my grandmother, but that is really big. If you want to do something that is as drastic as addressing global climate change, you know, there's governing bodies, there's academia, there's, you know, office things you can join, which is great. But what really matters is your neighbors and people around you. So you start, literally, you start you know, a couple of steps. So, hey, who's next to me? How are you? Who are you? What do you want to do? And then you center yourself around a set of values, something that you both agree on, you know, all three of you agree on. You start small. And then you center around those values and say, we're going to do something, right? Something. Could be small, great. But you're centering yourself around your values first. You've got that spark of inspiration. And then when you get that spark, that's when you find your anchoring organizations, things like the YouTube Butterfly Forum, right? You know, the Muscogee Nation is not represented in the, uh, um, the tribal uh, state status of tribes and climate change report. There's a natural report, except the YouTube butterfly farm if I mischance, right? So what you think may be minimal is actually has quite a bit of impact. So you start finding these groups, college in the Skogie Nation, right? You find these anchors, people that have resources, they have structure, but they can fuel that spark. And that spark that you bring grows. And then you build that fire. You find other organizations to join. And just as a fire, you wouldn't have one giant fire that everyone comes to, right? You have a bunch of small fires. Each reflects the values of those places, of those people. And so that's a way that you can kind of like think about how are we going to do something? Well, start yourself, your neighbor, or maybe find a local organization. And maybe this organization is seemingly simple, and it is. So when you think about 
engaging people internationally, tribe to tribe, or interinstitutionally, let's say we're working with environmental specialists, or I'm working with the college, or I'm working with the EPA, or all these different organizations, that same process still applies. And so, so I like to think of that, even if it's peoples that are, um, uh, you know, like uh, Anglo or some other, other person, it's still being a tribe, right? Because all peoples are indigenous to this planet. But I found that when you, when you center yourself around sovereignty, relationality, and responsibility, and you say, okay, now that we have these centered values, it's not about me. You know, it's about this value system. And then as I start to bring my partners on board and say, well, we want representation, right? You know, people from all places, especially if you're doing something international, right? So if I'm doing, a, you know, work and I'm, you know, I don't have people from, you know, the Southwest and Oklahoma and Great Lakes, you know, everyone's all just from one place. I'm not really getting, not only am I not getting the full picture, but I'm not getting the full experience. Right? Because people are different. People think differently. Like, literally think differently. So the more folks that you have, at least if you're in the center around those values, the more likely you are to learn from each other, to grow together, to integrate new knowledges and new ideas, and from those new knowledges and new ideas come new behavior. But what's just as important is to remember that what, what centers all of these peoples around these values are the places that they come in. Right, understanding the eco regions that you come from, the prairie, maybe it's woodlands, you know, foothills, there's many. So the more you can recognize that not every land is the same, and it's important to include the representation of the land that as almost greater than the people itself, but then again, clearer ideas, better behaviors, better actions, better decisions. But as you're moving forward, it's always important to remember your idea needs to have very clear directions, needs to have that guidance. But you also have to remember where is it that you come from, right? It's always said that um, you, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you're coming from. Right? And so that direction must also have very clear, concise vision. There's an old saying that vision without action is just a dream. But action without vision is a nightmare. <laughs> and so you have to recognize that as you especially if you form a group of people, even as an individual, there's power that motivates this, right? But that power must be balanced, right? Just, uh, that's why things like gender equity are important, intergenerational uh, composure, so making sure that you're learning from your elders and your youth, of uh, recognizing. Um, uh, I don't want to say class, but like you know, income level. Sometimes folks that are you know, in, you know, in poverty may not actually be. They might just be better at living simply and just the same. You may have someone that's making a lot of money, but isn't you know, may actually be in poverty. So you have that balance. You have that spectrum. But what really guides your power is, quite frankly, things like love, respect, empathy, compassion, integrity. You know, those things that make us feel like we're doing the right thing. And so this symbol, this is, comes from uh, some work that I've, I've done with the Knowledge Exchange Network. This isn't mine. You know, please take a picture of this. You know, we, we actually designed this to, to, to describe a metaphor using that same process. And we actually did it with a bunch of little kids in the sand. And because we knew if they could understand what this was, anyone could. And also with a lot of uh, inspiration and guidance from, from several elders. So, oh wait, my bad, we go back. Sorry. Yeah, and that uh, QR code will take you some cool stuff. I won't let me talk about it later, but yeah, made some cool tools. All right. So, resiliency. Uh, raise your hand. Do you know what resiliency is? Yeah. Have you never heard that word before, anyone? No. It's it's yeah. It's it means a lot of things, right? Like I've always heard resiliency. It's like imagine you got like a what was little. Uh, sock and bopper, little things. You knock it over, it comes right back up. Knock it over, it comes back up. Well, I think a better way to think about resiliency is the same root you think of like the idea of resolution, right? I want to be resolved in my action. So what we think of that same idea, like, well, how can I adapt and be, be resolute in the face of climate impacts or change and things like that? Well, I found a, a model, and this doesn't come from me, this comes from several folks, you know, some actually in Luke this Marshall, but it comes from this uh, idea that we have to think holistically, right? And so when you think about this kind of upper quadrant, what is community? 
right? If you're thinking that way, you're probably going to make the right decision, right? You know, uh, but that has to be balanced by knowledge is plural, and they have to be integrated. So it's one thing to, to be, I mean, it's good in the, you know, this kind of academia, but some people study things just to study them as opposed to really integrating what they're learning, right? So you have to kind of take that into the stall. But you have to be aware of your environmental hazards, right? You know, it's kind of like, I remember the College of Scope you know, they got that field out there, they wanted to do a test grow full of bituminous coal. You know why? Because there was a coal train that ran through there for decades, right? So you can't really grow in certain spots, so you have to be aware of your environment and you have to be scientific about it in some ways, right? And that's why I think colleges like College of Scope Nation, Charter Colleges, really, that even nowadays you can learn a lot without having to necessarily go to school, but it is a responsibility to learn these things. And then lastly, it has to be practical. You, know, you can have the greatest idea in the world, but if like grandma can't do it, it may not work, right? And it has to scale, right? So if I'm doing, you know, a little, like the whole behavior where I'm at, you know, if I really want to make a large movement and use my power, right, it has to be able to grow, it has to be bigger than me. And that's, that's why I think a lot of people get really, and at least it's less than it used to be, but it used to be people would do something great and keep it themselves. I don't want anyone else to know, so I don't want the credit. I say now, if you're producing anything, give it away as soon as you can. Like here, if you can do this better than me, please. Right, you know, and then maybe you'll find something to do better than you, right? So that's the scale of the component. So these four directions, um, I'm going to scan through pretty quick. But again, community needs, understand the needs, the integrated knowledge is it's really centering your consciousness and your experience, your lived life versus what you perceive, or including what you perceive. Understand soil, air, and water quality uh, principally. You know, I had a cousin who moved to Altus, and he had this brilliant idea to start growing weed. And he calls me, I was like, hey, you know anything about growing weed? He's like, well, check your soil, right? Because you can't really grow much. I don't know if you've been to Altus, but it's pretty dry and hot. Um, same thing, you got to understand what the hazards are. A lot of chemical spills in Oklahoma, and again, you might have this organic garden. It's like, hey, I feel tired all the time. Right, you know, maybe something healthy in there. So you gotta really know what you're getting into. And again, you gotta be able to do it. It has to be real. Um, I like this idea of agroecology when you're thinking of it's sort of agriculture, because when you're thinking about a living system that is interdependent, you know, it does include you, but it's necessarily just this resource that you can take. Right? You think of it in more in a relativity type of way. All right. So I want you to. I'd like to ask you some questions for consider to consider, um, and really think about yourselves right now where you're sitting. How will you position yourself as drivers of change? Are you some of you are? Some of you are restoring language. If some of you are doing the best educated community, right? Others are just here willing to take things in. But if you think about what's the responsibility of this? What grows from this? Second question. How to get your nations, plural, to lead this change? Right? This is a hard one. I don't know the answer to this. But it is a good <coughs> question to consider. Right? And really less about adapting to change, but leading change. Right? I think that's one of the, the greatest powers of living with, with a sovereign nation is we can determine our future for ourselves, but it has to be us, right? So that, that relationship is the huge piece, right? So we have to lead by example. Absolutely. And then the last question is, how do we ensure that our local systems can adapt to change, right? You know, the, the birds, the trees, you know, the animals, even little chip does, right? People try to, you know, those are, we need those. Don't be killing those, right? They're not all copperheads, I guarantee it. So these three questions, one more, how will you position yourselves as drivers of change? How to get your nation's best to that change? And how to get your local systems to that change? I know we're a bit out of time, but I'd love to have a conversation with you, maybe five minutes. Absolutely, take your time. I think sometimes, too, the elders need to let the young people know we're not always going to be here. We're not always here. Because 
coronavirus took a lot of our elders out <coughs> before their time. And a lot of that knowledge died with a lot of them. So we've got to share it now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think there's there's a challenge. I used to do some research with when we look at you know Gen Z students, and this was in, in like a, um, um, a university setting. And we found that we asked them, it's like, hey, do you know this thing? And they're like, oh, yes, of course. Oh, if you know this, but then when you actually get try to get them to orate it, they're like, oh, hang on real quick. I have to. <laughs> right. You know, which isn't necessarily a um, the point being is their their way of knowing is, is the access, right? But if you lose this, you lose that access, what knowledge do you have? Versus, say, a lot of elder, because arguably, it's just the years of experience, right? Because there's this, this uh, uh, quote from like Dr. Dan Walk, and he would always say that like just as easy as I can understand something, a language, a problem, whatever, I can just as easily misunderstand that same thing, right? But if I experience something, I can't mis-experience that thing. If it happened to me, and it happened, it happened in an emotional context, you have like all these other pieces that are attached to it, right? So experience is a very powerful feature. And if we were, you know, so again, just to, to uh, honor your idea, our greatest Baha'i teachers have that experience. Yes? Yeah, and throughout your presentation, especially on the climate portion of it, the thing that I kept coming back to that I'm thinking about is that first law of ecology where everything is connected to mm -hmm. everything else. And we live in a world that is very human-centric. Mm -hmm. And it's just the way our society has <laughs> taught and trained us, all of us. So through all of these changes, we have to keep remembering that all the other beings, all the plant beings and the animal beings, are all going to be affected negatively. You know, there's going to be shifts and changes. And even invasive species have kind of an inherent right, you know, because they're non-local beings. So whatever we think about climatic changes or changes in weather or the averages, we also need to consider how that is affecting the other things. And it's not just about services to human beings. It's services really to all beings and health. But it's, it's just an approach because we're already in an extinction crisis globally. Oh, yeah, I appreciate that. And, and again, like we we'll know do, you know, all things are related. But that idea is a lot older than us. That's generations deep, right? And so again, remembering our elders and remembering this, this ancestral wisdom, you know, and it's easy to understand, right? If I have to, yeah, I've actually got my master's in ecological science and engineering. It's a nightmare, right? And I, I guess I just remember we did a meta analysis of papers published under ecology. Something like eighty percent were like single species, right? Which is yeah, so like, but the multi-species interaction paper is like less than 5%. But like all of them, right. And so that ecology versus this kind of like deep ecology of our relationship with our environment, of our peoples, and more than just in the present, but throughout time, right? Mm -hmm. you know, so absolutely. So thank you then for that reminder. Can I take one more comment? Yes. I grew up on the coast of Georgia, and I was really lucky to see all kinds of creatures interacting with each other um, just as a little kid. And I got to go to the beach and just um, see these things in daily life. And I moved to Tulsa when I was 20. And it's a pretty, like, there's a lot of trees, and there's a lot of, you know, it's a pretty, as far as cities go, you see a lot. But the, the difference of, my upbringing and my husband's upbringing, he grew up with Broken Arrow. Um, he's just, I took him back to my hometown last year, and he just, every everywhere we turned, he couldn't believe how many different animals and biodiversity there was in this one little, like, 17 square mile area. Um, but I really liked what you said about the, um, just getting, uh, you know, like, like in, you know, the, the just intergenerational, um, 
things in, in the speaker before who was talking about getting kids started early and things like that. So I think that's so, so important. And also, um, when we got started here, talking about the generations that, that were you know, behind us and everything. So I think just the more we think that way, even if, we're, even if we don't have our own children yet, or if we are you know, helping taking care of our parents or whatever, I think just trying to keep that in mind, that interconnectedness is really important. And I think it actually resonates with people once you kind of explain it to them. Because they all have, you know, we all have family, even if you're not traditional or tribal necessarily, you still have your family. And I think it's, it's less of a, um, a daunting concept, I think, to tackle some of these problems when you break it down that way. This helped me feel a little less panicked about things, <laughs> you know, just approaching it in that way. So thank you for that. And Patrick, we cannot always live in fear. We have to live in hope. That's the main thing. Absolutely. All right, folks, thank you for your time. Very, very short five minute break, really five minutes, and then come back at the room, Dr. Taylor will come back.
introduce my name. She was very nervous today for a shoot. I like this all day. Not comfortable with that. I have some lessons today, but he couldn't, so my dad came with me. But it was really a bad glad to be here and have a new why I always do. It's very nice. <laughs>
speaker box says one more before lunch, right? One more speaker. Would you be able to do an interview during the chat? Would you be able to do the way to the
Okay, everyone, we're about to begin. <laughs> Because this is a big issue. We're dealing with insect collapse. 
a large scale across continents. We have to get ahead of it. And that means we all have to be involved. Well, I'll go on from there. I have a brother that I communicate with occasionally. And uh, we had a little talk about this particular adventure here, coming down here and talking about climate change. And when I told him I was coming here, he, uh, he advised me to sharpen my axe, since climate change is really a big tree. I responded that I've already been sharpening my axe and had taken on a few whacks at that tree already. But I said there's a bigger tree out there. There's a bigger tree that we need to chop down. There's a bigger tree that we need to attack. It's a tree with very tough bark and very hard wood. It's a tree of climate resilience. Climate indifference. Climate neglect. How do we get people to respond? It's partly what Patrick was talking about. And I'm going to talk about some of the same things, but in using different words. So, uh, going on from there, this is the title of my talk. And Jamie and I have had a few words about this. Because she said, well, if you come down and talk, send me a few titles. Well, I sent her about six or eight titles. All very simple. And this is what came back. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that basically what I have to do is tell you what to do and say how we're going to save the world. I don't think I can do that. Now, one of the things that I've been practicing for a very long time, and I'll tell you about one exception, is that I've been trying in my professional career not to tell people what to do. Offer advice, offer knowledge, offer little tips about how things are going, and let them reach their own decisions. The one exception is fishing for red salmon in Alaska. <laughs> I know how to do that. And I know how to do that because people taught me how to do that, and they told me how to do it. They're doing it wrong. <laughs> right. You've got to use more weight. You've got to use more line. There's leaders there. The leader isn't long enough. So when I'm up there, and there's always neophytes up there when I'm fishing for salmon, I tell them where to fish, I tell them how to use their line, I tell them how to drift, and I tell them how to land those fish. So that's the exception. So if you get the impression that I'm telling you what to do at the end of this particular talk, I'll deny it like all politicians do, right? <laughs> So, you know, I think it's useful to talk about how we got there, how we get to where we are today. So I'm going to review a few things that most of you know, or kind of understand intuitively, but we probably haven't thought about it thoroughly. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got here, and then we're going to talk about how the world got to where it is today. And then we're going to talk about the consequences of the main drivers in the system, and we're going to talk about those consequences on the basis for the, the planet and monarchs and us. And we're going to be talking about monarchs because they are one of the most resilient species out there. And if monarchs are going down, it means that a lot of other things are going down. So we have to understand what's really going on in the system. Now, when it comes to what we must do, it's got to be all about adaptation, mitigation, and advocacy. That's a slightly different way of approaching this from way uh, Patrick did. There's going to be a lot of adaptations as climate change. There's going to be a lot of mitigation. There's going to be a lot of advocacy. And maybe some of you will be advocates. Anyway, I'm an advocate for change. All right. The guy that you see in front of you was not always, not always 85 years old. At one time, he was 100 years old. And one time he was looking through the family albums and he spotted a picture of him when he was seven years old holding up a 10 pound snapping girl. Right? That picture was emblematic of three summers he spent with his grandmother on an 80 acre property up in northern Wisconsin in a little town called Privets, Wisconsin. And Privets, Wisconsin has a river running alongside of it called the Peshtigo River. And if you ever want to read about the worst fire, forest fire in the world. Look up the Pesco River fire. 
Anyway, a little trippy, got a Santa Turtle picture, and it got lost in the family album somewhere. And I had a woman come and visit me, and I, she wanted to interview me about a lot of things. I gave her hours and hours and hours. Told her this story about the little chippy in the picture I was missing. Couldn't find it for decades in my family. And I met her at a conference recently, and she gave it this. Aww. It's actually done by a Disney artist. So little Chippy at that particular time was, you know, six, seven, and eight years old, and he was discovering life. And that life was in that river, and it was extraordinary. It's a shallow river, lots of rocks, big ones, small ones, and the amount of life under those rocks was just incredible. And the first time that little kid saw a mud puppy, do you know what a mud puppy is? It's a centimeter about that long, and it's gray, and it's got black spots, and it's got these big red gills, and you reach under that rock and grab that thing, and it goes, and it's gone. Slipperiest damn thing you've ever seen in your life. All right. But fascinating, I mean, this kid was fascinating. This kid became a biologist because of this experience. And everything that happened on that property resonates today. <clears throat> so one of the things that was on that property that connects me with all of you is all the Native American artifacts. That was a pre-Columbian Native campground. Northern Forest Indians. Northern Forest Native Americans. And you couldn't imagine how they had to live up there. It's a really harsh environment. But there were five different types of berries. Who knows how many things that they ate out of that river? Including a lot of fish, a lot of crayfish, a lot of turtles, and what have you. So it filled my imagination. And it's part of what I've connected with a lot of people. Anyway, let's go on. That's how I got here. And it even connected me with honeybees, but that's another story. So I'm just part of and you are just part of 8 billion people on this planet. We need to understand how we got to 8 billion people because that is really driving what's going to happen in the future. It's driving, it's driven how we've gotten here so far. So if you go back to 1850, you see that we had 1.2 billion people. You go to 1950 and just basically double that population in 100 years. And then you go to uh, 2000, we're now up to 6.1 billion. And then in the last decade or so, the last 12 years, we've got a billion of billions. That's an extraordinary population. Absolutely extraordinary. And it's had a tremendous amount of consequences on this planet. And we have to understand how that happened, how we got there, what it means for all of us, what it's going to mean for the future. And it's a really big, serious thing that we have to think about. There's a, a line of academic research that is kind of referenced but in different words by Patrick. And, and what's the, your name is? Yvette. Yvette, I think you spoke about it too. It's called Complex Adaptive Systems. We live in a complex adaptive world where, indeed, everything is connected. And we have to understand those connections. And we are way, way, way behind the curve in understanding those connections. If we are going to adapt, if we are going to mitigate, if we are going to advocate, we have to understand how the world is put together. It's a tremendous challenge because we are very sparing with our resources in terms of understanding the world we live in. But we must do so. The very survival of the human population may well depend on that. So let's go to how we got here. What are the main drivers of the drivers? Fossil fuels, no doubt. Science, a way of studying the planet. Technology, which drives, derives directly out of science and invention. So these led to improved health care, greater survival at birth, longer lifespans, improved food production, large international commerce, 
of greater resource extraction, communication networks, universal education in many places, a lot of social change, better quality of life, empowerment of women is something that's still going on. Uh, we still are well behind on minorities. But all disabled or limited by geopolitics, culture, cultural resistance, and many times religion. So we have all of these things that are kind of derivative of fossil fuels and our way of looking at the world. If you look at this age of energy, you might ask when it started. And some of this age of energy started with the use of coal um, in the Industrial Re Revolution, but it really took off uh, right after the 1900s. And it took off after the 1900s because we learned to use fossil fuel and combustion engines. And we learned to use fossil fuel in a way to even make pharmaceuticals. So a lot of things can be traced just to the discovery of oil and the proliferation of the extraction of oil and the multiple uses to which oil was produced or, or uh, used. And it's just an amazing driving force. And one of the things that's kind of a mystery to me is why, when you look at um, what's going on in the planet in terms of the, the literature that's out there, Nobody really talks about this age of energy because it's really extraordinary. This extraordinary age of energy. What are the different things that's enabled us to do? And it's all based on fossil fuels, which were really starting to be explored in the United States in the 1870s. I'm 85, and I've lived almost half of that time. You know, half of this major expansion of the human population major expansion of the exploitation of the planet. This happened in my lifetime. And it's going to continue to happen in yours. So what does that going to mean? We have to understand what that means. I can't tell you that I understand what that means. But I think we have to be aware, we have to be watching, we have to be vigilant, and we have to be thoughtful. And that's difficult. Getting politicians and getting many much of our population to think ahead to look into the future is difficult. We can make models, but accepting the models and acting on them is really a difficult thing. We are very comfortable as a population in this country. We, we want for very few things, except many of us who are below the line. We're too comfortable. We may be too comfortable to care. And then you look at the rest of the world, and the rest of the world is living on a dollar or two dollars or three dollars or four dollars a day, and they're too impoverished here. So how do we deal with this climate indifference? And that's what Patrick was trying to talk about, with the building is fire. Anyway, we'll get into a little bit of that, and I'll get into a little bit about how I'm thinking about this as we go along. So let's take a look at one of the graphics here for what's going on. I don't know if you can see this, it's pretty faded, but this is the world climates from 1000 to present, and we went ahead with a medieval warming period that ended at about 1300, and we had the Little Ice Age that went from 1300 to about 1850. The Little Ice Age was a lot colder than it is now. And then the Industrial Revolution started, and only a few countries didn't really have a big effect on the climate because it didn't increase CO2 that much. But then when we got to about the 1870s or 1900s, then the climate really, the temperatures really began to rise. And CO2 began to rise. So if you look at uh, the details here, CO2 went from 285 in 1850 to 421 today. Massive increases in CO2. Now you get people that argue about CO2 is very, very low content in the atmosphere. Can't possibly have an impact. And humans can't be possible, you know, be accounting for this massive increase in CO2. Yes, we can. And the reason is that there are isotopes of carbon. The main isotope of carbon is carbon-12. That's the carbon in plants. Plants pick up lighter carbon isotopes. Carbon-13 is a heavier isotope. 
it's an isotope that, all, that also decays. So when you look at fossil fuels, there's almost no carbon-13 in any fossil fuel of any kind. It's decayed. And it was not really taken up by the plant matter that constituted that fossil fuel. So you have a lot of carbon-14 thrown in, or carbon-12 thrown into the atmosphere. It has diluted and lowered the amount of ratio of, of carbon-13 in the atmosphere. So we know the historical ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 in the atmosphere. So now it's been diluted, and it's been diluted in proportion to all of the burning of fossil fuels. That's something to use when you run into a climate denier. We have that impact. We can show that impact. All right. I put this together, it kind of gives you an idea of what's happened over the last 45 years in the United States, in the growing season. And this is very concerning. Less concerning here than in California. You don't want to be in any coastal state in the coming years. It's all the coastal states are getting warmer. Why are they getting warmer? because the oceans are getting warmer. And so uh, you see this, this, these red states, these red states are all coastal. You see all the five states, those, are, those five states are all coastal. And the reason for that is that the coasts are warmer. The coastal waters are warmer. And so this is what we see in the summer months. But why isn't it warmer in the Midwest? Because the jet stream that's over Canada and has an impact on the weather that's from the Dakotas over to Michigan and then down as far as Oklahoma. What if the jet stream changes? We know that major currents are changing in the atmosphere. We know that major currents are changing in the ocean. So this is a concern. This is the pattern now. Now I haven't done it, but I've looked at the data enough to know that if we do this for the winter months, the non-growing season, you're going to see that the warming is greater in the Midwest than it is along the coast. So the, just the reverse would happen if we look at the winter months. You know, there, they, they used to have a lot of fishing contests up in the northern states. We were not fewer. I used to be able to ice fish in Orange, Kansas. You know, you can see your frozen lake anymore. Certainly not in the last few years. Or if you do see one in only the last few days. So, yeah, things are changing in the winter. And they're changing drastically. And that has an impact on a lot of things that we're going to be talking about. All right. Now, there's a language here. We talk about this. Talk about climate change. And it comes in the form of Edges, idioms, proverbs, slogans, it comes from our elders, it comes from commercial enterprises, it comes from the Bible, it comes from ancient um, Chinese writings. And I'm going to go through a few of those for you because I think they're kind of fun to think about and remember because we know how to talk about the, all of this. We have been told what's happening by our elders and others, and we're told how to respond to all of this. So we know how the world works, and that's what these idioms tell us. And these problems. Are All right. Let's, let's see. All right. First one probably comes from physics. For every action, there is a reaction. Every action has consequences for cost. Every footprint, every drop of gas used to power our cars, every unit of electricity, even from renewable sources, has an effect on cost. Everything has a cost. Everything. Every action produces a reaction. All right, next one. This is commercial in order. There is no free lunch. Same sort of thing. Everything has a cost. You know where that came from? It used to be in bars. They would advertise a free lunch if you came in and drank that. <laughs> yeah, free lunch, which you've got to pay for with all the stuff you drink, right? All right, this is biblical. Reap what you sow. All right, what have we sown? Through the burning of fossil fuels, greenhouse gases have increased from 285 to 421 in the span that we're talking about, and global temperatures have increased to 
1.1 centigrade. That's only 0.4 centigrade away from what most people consider to be a disaster. The increasing temperatures have resulted in melting glaciers, rising sea levels, increasing droughts and flooding, uh, rising ocean temperatures, stronger hurricanes, seasonal changes in phenology, uh, declining wildlife, including insects, and more. And the changes are just beginning. These consequences represent a really bitter harvest. Before we sow, and we have sown what is really amount to a bitter, bitter harvest. Another one comes from commercial enterprises. If you break it, you own it. We broke it. And we're continuing to break it. Can we fix it? Yeah, probably. Will we fix it? That's the real question, isn't it? Will we fix what we broke it? All resources are finite. I kind of made that one up, but I think all of us who have studied any resource acquisition understand this. There are no unlimited resources. All can be exhausted or changed. We live in a closed system. We have to understand the limits of this system. The name as we heard earlier, from the event, all things are connected. Everything cycles. From the deepest oceans to the surface. From the bottom of the atmosphere to the top of the atmosphere. Everything cycles. Some things cycle fast, some things cycle slow. You know, I've been thinking about, you know, is there anything free? Isn't there something free? Yeah, sort of. I think photons are free. <laughs> Light comes from the sun. That's about as free as you can get, but nothing else. Nothing else. All right, just a few more here to put, in, put all of this in, in common language here. There is a massive butterfly effect. There are ripples, large and small, in air and water that span the planet. El Nino events that start in the Middle Pacific have detectable impact across the planet. There are seasons when dust from Africa reaches the Midwest. You know? It's, it's one world, it's a small world, and things are all connected. Now, we're getting to implementation, advocacy, and so on. Actions speak louder than words. We've had a lot of talk. Talk is cheap. But actions require implementation, and it takes commitments, resources, planning, sometimes inventions, and of course, dollars. Action is required. There is no alternative. We have to act. We will pay the price if we don't. And then, nothing ventured, nothing gained. If nothing is ventured, humanity will be overwhelmed by change. The outcome is in our hands, isn't it? We are masters of our own faith. Just do it. The time to talk is over. We know what we have to do, just do it. And then, then lastly, the Chinese proverb, every journey starts with a single step. Resilience is all about taking those steps, one step at a time. Patrick was talking about the same thing. And then, from what Patrick was saying, I came up with a couple more that I had in my teaching here. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, it's an all hands on deck sort of thing that we're involved with. But, given that we're dealing with complex adaptive systems, if it's all hands on deck, we really have to understand what our actions will mean, what our actions will bring. What will be the consequences of all that we do? All right, now I'll move on to other subjects. You know, as Patrick told us that uh, we're going to get more rainfall, we're going to have more extreme heat, and so on and so forth. So a couple of other things, you know, once it we get the extreme heat, extreme rainfall, we're going to find out that we're going to, people are going to tell us it's raining cats and dogs. Yeah, sure. Um, and those experiences in heat waves will tell us and demonstrate, you can see a lot of demonstrations on, on Google. It was so hot you could cry a pig out. And we like to, you know, as, as a population, we are, and this is an example, we are likened to the frog except the water on the stove that annoys the gravel warming until it is too late. 
And then we will be reminded that we have been making hay while the sun shines for too long. And now we must pay the, the bill is due, and we must pay the piper. I had fun putting this together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the consequences of very indulgent behaviors. But there is a serious point down here at the bottom. And this is a report that just came out this past week. Economists are looking at what happens, what is happening. And they have determined that these extreme events that are increasing in number and severity are destroying the infrastructure, which means that governments and citizens are forced to spend money rebuilding rather than investing and creating. In other words, this thing that we've created is kicking the legs out from under us. It's another metaphor, another day, kicking the legs out from under us. We're in an unstable condition, so we have to be resilient. We have to get back to a greater point of stability. So I'm going to show you just a little statistics here that are kind of concerning, to say the least. This is the number of days of 100 degrees in San Francisco, in San Antonio, per decade. You go back to the 1890s, and it was 3.9 days a year when you have 100 degree temperatures. In the 19 or the 2010s, it was 17 days per year when you would have 100 degree temperatures. That number is expected to double by 2036. Whoa. I don't think I've done a move to San Antonio. Right. This is data from uh, Austin showing pretty much the same pattern. And I think I saw a, a note on San Antonio that was just last year, 2022. They had the hottest summer ever. They had 59 days, 103 touch. That's an infusion. It's getting warmer. And this is the kind of heat that we can relate to because this, is, this affects all of us. This affects our energy bills. It affects all, all, everything that's been done with that. All right, this is another figure showing all of that for Austin. And you can see how solid that's becoming over there to the right, where it's just getting warmer and warmer and warmer. Uh, Texas temperatures are expected on average over Texas to be average three degrees warmer uh, by 2036. All right, now we're going to go to Monarch Park Park. And this is Chip Taylor trying to enter the school for Monarch Studies in 1992. You know, it's, it's really hard at first to learn to pull over, open the door. I eventually pulled open the door and, and really got involved with Monarch Studies starting in 1992. Um, it was a challenge for sure because I was way behind the curve. But we are way behind the curve on a lot of things. And the only way to get ahead of the curve, the only way to anticipate what's going on is to study and to make mistakes and to learn. Right? So I learned, and I have a lot of wonderful experiences with monarchs, things that you don't really understand, but uh, you just stand in awe of. Here I am in Mexico, standing in the midst of a river of butterflies that are leaving the colonies and going down slopes looking for water. And I talked to you about a river of butterflies that I hate. If these are narrow passages of butterflies, maybe 100 feet across, going at 12 miles an hour, that out of hell sort of stuff. And they're coming so fast that they bump into things. Um, it's, it's really astonishing. And here's one picture of it. How many butterflies are in that picture? And that was just one second. Yeah? It's got to be thousands. And that goes on for hours. You know, two or three hours in the morning, you'll see this river form. Then in the afternoon, they will go back up to the colonies, but not in the same form. They'll go up in multiple rivers to get to the colonies. They take the time to get back. So you've heard a lot about how monarch populations have declined. A lot of it is misuse of information, quite frankly. Um, we've had really good populations in the early 90s. And then we had a lot of habitat loss starting in uh, 1998, uh, going through 2006 because of the adoption of Robert Berry Corn and Soybeans. And if you look at a lot, of, a lot of these things over here on the left, you'll see that there are various years in which the population has declined for various obvious reasons. 2004, 2009, really cold summers, 
they couldn't develop the population very well in the population in mind. You get uh, butterflies coming too far north too soon. Uh, as in 2012, and I'll show you this, they come too far north too soon, then lay their eggs in areas which should be colder. They take them too long to develop. The age of the first reproduction is much older, and the population declines because they don't have enough uh, co of a cohort breeding in the southern part of the distribution to produce uh, enough butterflies in the northern part of the distribution that would lay a lot of eggs in the summer. Then you have a situation like 2013 in which the butterflies coming out of, of Mexico were so slow and so late in getting to the northern breeding areas that essentially they lost half a generation, if not more. Right? So everything that I see in these data is determined by two things. One is habitat availability, but once we understand habitat availability, then we look to weather. Habitat availability provides the upper limit, the upper standard for what the population can reach under the best optimal conditions. But those occur very, very, very rarely. So what determines what happens all the rest of the time? That's weather. Weather, approximate weather, determines what goes on from month to month. So in order to understand this, I've broken this population's annual cycle down into six stages. So this, I'm building what we call a stage-specific model. So you have overwintering that occurs down here in, in Mexico, where S1 is, and what's going on in each of those stages, because they're defined temporally, they're defined by months, they're defined by what the plants are doing, and so on and so forth. So I, I don't have time, I don't think you need to go into all of the data here, but uh, the point here is that if you look at these stages, you understand what's going on what goes into a stage, what happens within a stage, you can pretty much get an idea of what's available to start the next stage. So it's, it's a simple progression. So what I'm going to talk to you about is what's changing out there for monarchs. Because it's changing out there for all of us. So the spring temperatures are changing. The fall temperatures are changing. Droughts are becoming more common and more severe. Diapause, which is an overwintering stage for these butterflies. Diapause is... Um, something that is dependent on temperature. Entering diapause is something they have to do before they migrate. They have to become non-reproductive. So what does it take to become non-reproductive? It takes a good contrast between daytime temperatures and nighttime temperatures. There has to be a significant gap between day and night. And that gap is closing. That's getting narrower and narrower. It, in the southern part of the distribution, it's getting warmer and warmer to the point where it doesn't look like a lot of monarchs are going to be able to enter diapause and therefore not migrate. Because being in diapause is a prerequisite for migration. It sets the table for using their orientation to the changing patterns of uh, light that's coming in as the sun angle changes. And then we've heard Bill Mimi mention today we got a really big El Nino coming up starting at the end of this year. El Nino is associated with some very nasty overwintering mortality that has occurred uh, at the overwintering sites. All right, let's talk about the temperature change per decade and then let's uh, look at how this relates to uh, where the monarchs are moving through. So the monarchs come into um, Texas in March. And so the temperatures they increase that they experience in March are really important in determining how far north this population goes, how fast it goes, and so on and so forth. And I don't know if you can see it very well. Yeah, you can see this, the pink. The pink shows the rate of change in temperature per decade from 1982. And you don't want to be anywhere where the temperatures are really increasing a whole degree per decade. That's not where we want to be. We want to be, if temperatures are increasing, we want to hit the either no increase or maybe a tenth of a degree per decade. Let us slow this down. Because what that means is that you're getting a biological effect over a period of four decades. So right now, the temperatures in Texas are averaging, across those cities, are averaging about four degrees more than they were 40 years ago. That's meaningful. Because it has, it has biological effects. Sorry? Fahrenheit or Celsius? Uh, the, these, are, these are all Fahrenheit. Still relevant. 
because that's well, well over two degrees centigrade over four, um, four years. All right, then we go to September, and we see the same sort of effects, except now we're involving the northern cities as well, Minneapolis, Des Moines, Topeka. And what that means is the, mod the migration just slowed down. When it gets really hot, the, mi the butterflies don't move. There are consequences. The butterflies aren't moving, they're hanging up in trees. Uh, some of them may be starving, others because they can't get the nectar because it's too hot. Others may be just taking too long. But every time we see temperatures going up in the fall, the populations that reach the overwintering sites in Mexico are lowest. Looks like there's a mortality event. There are more days on the road. More opportunities for accidents to happen, that sort of thing. So anyway, those are the two, two easy, obvious things that we see changing that are having impact on the butterflies. But if we look at what's going on in the, in, in the data, you can see that the slopes indicate uh, these changes in these pretty southern cities. And they're pretty dramatic. And it doesn't look like they're going to reverse. This is a pattern that looks like it's going to continue. All right, and the threat post by El Nino, I've kind of preempted myself here. Um, the consensus is that there will be a El Nino by the end of the summer. Stuff I saw last night online indicated that they expect to have a big El Nino. What El Ninos tend to do is they tend to spin off moist air toward um, the east. That has happened several times in the course of, of what we've been seeing down there. And, uh, Mexico, and these El Nino events are associated with monarch mortality in Mexico, uh, drought and crop failure in Australia, Asia, and South Africa. And the winter rain followed by freezing temperatures killed 70 and 80% of the monarchs in 2002, 2004. Fortunately, those populations were robust enough so that they were uh, able to recover, they were resilient. And then the snow cover, uh, the snow following the uh, El Nino-like events that occurred in 2010 and 2016 killed 50 and 60 percent of the monarchs. So there's another thing about El Nino. The prediction is that if El Nino is as strong as they think it is, that 2024 will be the hottest ever recorded as a global temperature for the planet. Okay. So this is what El Nino does. If the El Nino pushes warm, moist air in various ways, mostly to the east, and it creates these areas where there isn't very much moisture. So in uh, 2024, if this map is any indication of what's going to happen, in 2024, Oklahoma and Texas should be all right in terms of moisture. But after that, all bets are off once the El Nino resides. Well, there's the diapause, and I kind of told you all about the diapause already. It would probably take too much time. So, um, yeah, I'm really concerned about diapause because that means that as it gets warmer, fewer and fewer butterflies will be joining the migration because they won't be able to go into diapause. Now, the threats posed by droughts in Texas. I've been getting into some of the Texas climatology data. And that, you know, it doesn't directly apply to Oklahoma, or it doesn't. Probably does, right? And uh, you're close enough to Texas, you're going to feel the effects of Texas uh, climate. But Texas looks to be like the next dry state. It looks to be like the next state that is going to be begging for water and trying to figure out its water problems. So, you know, migrations of this butterfly require nectar from flowers. There's got to be a lot of it. And it's got to be distributed from Canada all the way down to Mexico. So we're working on a paper on that right now, and it's clear that it's, it's like a butterfly is a moving car. It has to stop every once in a while to pick up fuel. The fuel is converted to the carbohydrates and the nectar are converted to lipids. Then the lipids, in turn, if they're needed, are broken down into a blood sugar called trailers. And that trellis fuels the activities, the metabolism of the butterfly, and allows it to keep flying. But if you get to a point where there's a drought, we can see that the lipid contents in the butterflies go way, way down. We can see that they're struggling. We can see that in the data that comes in at the end of the year, 
that if there is a drop that the butterflies are passing through, the population is going to be smaller. That suggests that there's a lot of mortality associated with these droughts. So it's like they run out of gas. They're running out of energy. So in effect, that means that there's a breakdown in the system. Now fortunately, once you get into Mexico, they get into a higher elevation. But the temperatures are cooler, and there's more flowers, and they load up just before they get to the overwintering sites. If we didn't have those Mexican areas that were kind of so far isolated from droughts, monarchs would be in real trouble. Alright. Unfortunately, droughts are expected to increase in frequency and intensity in the coming years. There's one quote here that just kind of blew my mind. This points to a fundamental shift in soil moisture for the region to a drier state comparable to or even exceeding the driest century of the last thousand years. Damn. I don't like that. So what, what must we do? Getting back to that point that Patrick was leading us to. Adaptation. There's going to be a lot of adaptation. We're going to have to figure out how to use energy more efficiently. We're going to have to figure out how to grow our crops more efficiently. We're going to have to figure out how to protect all sorts of things from an increased heat. Um, and we're going to have to get involved in a lot of mitigation. It means we're going to have to uh, address abuses and changes. Like we heard earlier, we've got all of these uh, super fun sites. Well, they drag it on, drag on. And I've been involved in the super site restoration. It's complex, it's difficult, and it's very, very expensive. And then we have to advocate. Because the only way we're going to get out of this in terms of a step forward, we have to stop talking. We have to cut down that tree of climatic endurance. We have to be a population that is led <coughs> by Greta's. You know who Greta is, right? You know Greta Thunberg? Yep. Fifteen years old. She told us what to do. So overall, we have to be resilient. But we have to also be mindful that we're dealing with complex adaptive, adaptive systems. And there we have to go back to what I was talking about before. You know, if there is no free lunch, everything has a cost, everything is connected, and every action has a reaction. We have to understand what we're doing. This takes study. This takes stepping up and thinking ahead. And I've had the experience of trying to get a lot of people to think ahead. I even walked into the dean's office one day and said, you know, we're not preparing our students for the future. I got no work. You know, not even a discussion about that. What does that mean? But there are articles out there now, popping up in the academics around the world, saying that we're really not preparing ourselves for the future. We must do that. Well, at this point, you know, last couple of thoughts. It's true, butterflies aren't free. We value monarchs and pollinators. We'll have to invest in their conservation. And as part of that process, we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Now, when Jane and I started the team project, the idea was to do a lot of restoration. And the restoration is part of it. And we worked with seven tribes to restore native milkweeds, sometimes native plants, uh, to their properties. And the tech mission is to do pretty much the same. This is a three-month plug. These plugs were planted in various tribal lands. This shows a group coming back from planting uh, in Shawnee um, uh, a few years ago, having had a good time, having felt that they'd done a good thing. And then we have the proof of concept. These were milkweeds that were planted the year before. And the monarch butterflies came in in the spring. The females from those plants. They laid a lot of eggs. And they ate them up. 
Damn, that was good. <laughs> All right, climate change is in our hands. This is a poster that just came out from an organization that I've belonged to for a long time. I've been on the steering committee of this organization. I don't know why they still uh, allow this old guy to be on that thing, but maybe they have something to go off with. But, you know, the climate change is in our hands. And we talked about this poster for months. And when it came out the other day, I said, I've got to show that. That's a beautiful image. It tells everything that we want to tell people. You know, it's all hands on deck. It's all in our hands. We're all in this together. All right, with that, what do I want to say thank you? <laughs> I only come to Kansas. <laughs> and this is truly the end. All right, thank you.
a little bit less and we're going to start watering. Right now, a good time? Um, I'm actually about to leave here after this. Okay, okay sure. Um, would you mind if we went a little ways kind of out there just so we're. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh you. -huh. 